Lord of Mysteries, Chapter 770, A Child Should Act Like a Child. Mr. X is looking for people with abnormal luck. Above the gray fog, Klein ruminated over the information Miss Magician had provided, in an attempt to analyze anything of use. After thinking to no avail, he decided to approach it from another angle. He first recalled the people who had abnormal luck around him to see if there were any connections. Hem, the fog sees strongest hunter Anderson Hood counts as one. Dr. Aaron Ceres is another. Hum, both of them were affected by one of the snakes of fate. Angel of Fate Auroboros was one of the creators of Rose Redemption. This secret organization supports and believes the true creator. The Aurora Order is equivalent to the true creator's church. A series of circumstances surfaced in Klein's mind as he quickly came to a conclusion. This is Angel of Fate Auroboros' attempt to search for Snake of Fate Will Ossipton. He is driving the members of the Aurora Order to help him find Snake of Mercury Will Ossipton. And this implies that behind Mr. X, there's a King of Angels existing somewhere in Backlund. Under such circumstances, assassinating Mr. X will be equivalent to having a death wish. It's no wonder Mr. X doesn't care about the uniqueness of Backlund. The official factions would at most imagine that he has a saint backing him. Hum, in the official dossiers, the Aurora Order only has five saints. This way, they will respond in the wrong manner. After Klein made the judgment, the first thought he had was to decline Miss Magician's request, and also to warn her not to provoke Mr. X, if it wasn't because sounding the alarm might affect Snake of Mercury Will Ossipton. While the Church of the Evernight Goddess clearly had records of Dr. Aaron Ceres's bout of bad luck, Klein would have gotten Miss Magician to report both the Angel of Fate Auroboros and Mr. X to a particular church. He calmly thought for another few seconds and conjured the world jam and sparrow, making him pray in the gray fog. I'll confirm the situation and give you a reply tomorrow. He didn't directly reject her commission, as he planned on first asking Snake of Mercury Will Ossipton. He then immediately returned to the real world, and he carefully took out the extremely fragile paper crane from his wallet before gently unfolding it. Klein wasn't in a rush to write anything. Instead, he first recalled the various questions he needed to consult Will on. After thinking up a draft, he got out a pencil and sharpened it with a blade. After stretching his muscles, Klein wrote, The members of the Aurora Order are searching for people with abnormal luck. I wonder if you know how to use the worm of time to create charms. Does your placenta blood count as a mythical creature's blood? If it does, I hope to obtain one drop. What price would I have to offer? Klein had originally planned on asking Will Ossipton how he was able to maintain his rationality. After all, the church's information indicated that there had been no public faith in the snake of fate. However, he ultimately curbed himself from doing that, afraid that Will Ossipton in his infant state replied, How did you conceive the notion that I'm rational? That way, he had no idea if Will was joking or speaking the truth. Hum, although there's no organization that believes in the snake of fate, there are certain areas that believe in the god of luck. It's considered a traditional custom. Perhaps they are an alternative identity of Will Ossipton or Auroboros. Klein mumbled silently and used the best of his clown abilities before managing to refold the paper crane. He then placed it underneath his pillow. After doing all of that, he had the time to calculate how much cash he had. 17,046 pounds, 5 gold coins, 3 solely, and 8 pence in change. If I had assets like a house, manor, and company shares, having so many liquid assets would make me quite a tycoon in Backland. Of course, I'm still very far from being a top tycoon. To reach them, one's overall assets need to be a million pounds. As Klein was glad that he had quite a bit of money, he recalled his debt, as well as the large investments that he needed to make in order to develop his persona's image. He then drank a mouthful of water, got into bed, and covered himself with a light but warm blanket before he slowly fell asleep. Amidst his reverie, Klein suddenly snapped awake and saw the desolate black plains. He walked all the way to the pitch black steeple in the middle of the plains, passing through the chaotic and abnormal layout before coming deep into the steeple. Like before, there was a circle of tarot cards on the ground. However, the protruding area in the middle of the tarot cards didn't have any silvery lines written. Well, Ossipton didn't give a reply. Then why did he pull me into this dream? Amidst Klein's puzzlement, he suddenly saw a black baby pram roll out of the shadows. In it was an infant whose looks were indiscernible while it was wrapped in silver silk. <laughs> Mr. Snake of Fate, Klein politely and cautiously asked. The infant immediately said in a clear voice, What makes you so sure it's a mister? Isn't that determined from your name? Don't mind such details. Klein lampooned and relaxed due to the attitude he was given. Then, how may I address you? Will Ossipton in baby form tersely answered as it said, Stumped, I haven't decided. 
As you know, oh, you don't. Every time I start again, I try to make myself a little different, so as to maintain a good mental state. A child should act like a child while they're a child. Klein's heart stirred when he heard that. Is this the way the monster pathway maintains its reasoning so as to resist madness? In the black pram, Will Ossipton replied briskly, Yes, every beginning washes away the madness. However, it still needs certain anchoring from faith. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to maintain my state as a sequence one for too long. He <laughs> he, compared to before, you're becoming more and more knowledgeable. Oh, apart from anchoring oneself with faith, there are other ways to resist the madness. However, restarting is clearly an ability of sequence one snake of fate of the monster pathway. Other Bayonder pathways aren't able to emulate that. Mr. Azik is constantly losing his memories and repeatedly finding himself. Does it also involve the same concept? Klein nodded in thought as he made every second count by asking. I suspect our Roboros is searching for you through the Aurora Order members. Will Ossipton scoffed. I've been playing hide and seek with him for a very long time. He isn't good at such matters. It's quite obvious that he doesn't have a childhood. Every time he restarts, he grows up beside the true creator. He lacks the psychological experience of the different stages in life, causing him to be very crazy at times. But of course, he doesn't mind. I did inform Rixiardo to use the die of probability in certain places and leave marks. This will mess up Auroboros' judgment. He will soon leave Backland once again. That means there's still chance of assassinating Mr. X. Yes, when the time comes, I'll divine the level of danger above the gray fog. Klein didn't continue on this topic as he asked, Do you know how to use the worm of time to create charms? Well, Ossipton didn't directly answer and instead returned with a question. You obtained a worm of time from Palace Zorost. How did you know? Klein was taken aback as he asked. He wasn't surprised that Will Ossipton had managed to mention the origins of the worm of time. After all, there weren't many demigods in the Marauder Pathway who could create avatars, but why hadn't he assumed that it was Blasphemer Ammon? The latter could also leave behind a worm of time. Will Ossipton smiled and said, Palace Zorost isn't in good condition, and he had to parasitize your former colleague. All right, your former colleague was investigating Sherlock Moriarty, and he had entered my house in the middle of the night. I sensed that there was something problematic about him and had given him a short period of bad luck, causing him to encounter other demigods hidden in Backland. And when he was in danger, Palace Zorost had taken action. Haha, -ha, it would have been fine even if he hadn't taken action. It's only a prank. I would have given your former colleague sufficient good luck at the critical moment. Leonard is investigating Sherlock Moriarty. The grandpa in his body is called Palace Zorost. Klein frowned slightly, unsure where the problem stemmed from. Will Ossipton continued, The creation of a worm of time charm isn't too difficult for you. You can pray to that uniqueness trait about you and use a compound of mercury and pure silver as a medium to draw the corresponding symbols. It's not too difficult. Pray to the fool. That's right. The mysterious space above the gray fog clearly has a form of attraction to the marauder pathway. Klein was thrilled as he felt like he had grasped something. At this moment, Will smiled and added, As for what the corresponding symbol is, I've no idea. What a huge reversal. Klein couldn't help but twitch the corner of his lips. When he noticed that Will Ossipton wasn't speaking any further, he hurriedly smiled and said, There's another question. About your placenta blood. Before he could finish his sentence, Will suddenly opened his mouth and let out a cry. Wava. He began wailing like a real infant. Can't we talk normally? Klein froze in his spot. If he hadn't already confirmed it, he really would have suspected whether the entity before him was a sequence one the president of the life school of thought. All right, all right. I just wanted to ask if it's the blood of a mythical creature, Klein said as he raised his hands midway. Will stopped crying and said with a laugh, of course, but I'll swap it ahead of time. Otherwise, everyone will die on the spot. He paused for a moment before saying, if you can give me something suitable, it's not impossible to give you one drop. All right, goodbye. Just as Will Ossipton said that, Klein felt the steeple shake as the dream rapidly shattered. Soon, he woke up. Chapter 771, Luck Siphon. What item would a snake of fate be interested in? Klein slowly sat up and leaned against a pillow. He thought for some time and decided to consider it at a later date. After all, he was still at least a month away from Will Ossipton's birth. He could also leave the question for the hermit Catalia and Queen Mystic Bernadette, who was backing her, to rack their brains over. Of course, Klein didn't eliminate the possibility of Will Ossipton's sudden choice of having an early birth. He slowly turned his attention into creating a worm of time charm. According to Will Ossipton's explanation, he had most of the conditions required, but he was just short of the corresponding symbol. Pray to the fool and use the powers of the mysterious space above the gray fog. 
I wonder if a symbol corresponding to the Marauder pathway would work. Even if it does, I don't know what it is. Unless I pull a Marauder above the gray fog and let the high back chair produce the corresponding pattern. As Klein thought about the details, he suddenly had an idea. In that case, perhaps he could try the symbol behind the fool's chair. It was the pupil less eye, a symbol representing secrecy, and the contorted lines that represented change. I wonder if it will work. Divination won't be able to rule it out by elimination, but I can predict if the attempt will be successful. Besides, even if it fails, it shouldn't be too big a problem. After all, I'm praying to myself. Even if the material were to be wasted in the experiment, it would enter above the gray fog and not be lost. With this in mind, Klein felt pumped. He couldn't help but get out of bed to try out the experiment that very night. A material like the worm of time that's left behind by a marauder demigod at Ammon's level still has its essence and level even if it's dead. When using it for a charm, it might not reach the level of an angel for various reasons, but it wouldn't be too far off. It'll be about the peak strength of a saint. If Klein succeeded, it would be equivalent to having an additional trump card. At critical points in time, it might give him an additional life. So how could he not be excited and expectant? I can only stir some of the powers of the mysterious space above the gray fog. The level of the worm of time charm will likely drop a little more. But regardless, it will definitely be like the ninth law given to me by Admiral Amirius. If I use the Blatherer's Aura to create a high-level charm in the Devil Domain, it will likely be at the level of the ninth law. Unfortunately, I wouldn't dare to pray to the dark side of the universe. Klein wore his pajamas as he stood barefooted. He walked took four steps counterclockwise on a thick carpet as he chanted the incantation before entering above the gray fog. Sitting at the fool's seat at the end of the long bronze table, he conjured a dark red fortune teller in yellowish-brown goatskin. He wrote down the corresponding divination statement. The charm I'm about to begin making will be successful. Unwinding the spirit pendulum from his wrist, Klein held it with his left hand and entered the state of cogitation. After repeating the divination statement seven times, he opened his eyes and saw the topaz spinning counterclockwise at a rather slow speed and ordinary amplitude. This means that it will succeed. But that begs the question, will it successfully verify that the symbol I use is effective, or successfully verify that it doesn't work? As an experienced seer, Klein attempted to interpret the revelation, but he failed to obtain any confirmation. With regards to that, he could only decide to experiment. There was no way for him to eliminate the mistakes if he didn't do so. Right on the heels of that, Klein wrote a new divination statement. The assassination of Mr. X this Friday will be dangerous. This time, the topaz pendant continued spinning clockwise at a faster frequency and greater amplitude. There's significant danger, but it doesn't reach the level of a demigod's participation, much less that of a king of angels. If it involves an existence of that level, he will definitely sense my divination and resist it. From the looks of it, Angel of Fate Auroboros will soon be led out of Backland. This means that the danger itself is a result of Mr. X and his subordinates. It's within the limits of what I can handle. As long as I don't make a mistake, the chances of success are pretty high. Klein made a judgment, put down the pen and paper, and returned to the real world. As a mysticism expert who often created charms, he had no lack of common materials. He immediately got out some candles and lit them on the table. Following that, he set up a simple altar against the glow of dusk. He then used a piece of silver to draw out the combined symbol that represented the fool. As Klein didn't know what path number the fool represented or what magic labels there were, he could only ensure that both sides remained equal. According to the books of charms he had read, these would similarly satisfy the rules of mysticism, but the corresponding might would be reduced. The chances of failure would rise because the existence that one was praying to could consider it as being irreverent and not pious enough. Of course, it wasn't a problem for Klein since he wouldn't reject himself. After completing the act of carving the symbol, Klein found a metal bottle and used his spirituality together with a container, and he then poured the mercury out and filled the carved-out pattern. This time, he decided to complete only the front side for now. He would then summon himself and respond to himself. He would then bring the worm with the twelve translucent rings back to the room and then place it on a silver sheet. After doing all of this, Klein adjusted the altar and took two steps back. He then said in ancient Hermes, the fool that doesn't belong to this era. Following the process, he completed the necessary steps before taking four steps counterclockwise and entered the space above the gray fog. After imbuing himself with the Black Emperor card, he used his spirituality to stir a tiny amount of the powers above the gray fog to respond to his prayers. While the surging energy poured into the circle of light, Klein didn't hesitate to return to the real world. 
he saw the altar had turned dark and gloomy as though there were countless secrets hidden here, and the silver sheet had already floated up, fusing with the worm of time's corpse. Klein took two steps forward, flipped the silver sheet around, and he filled the carved symbol on the back with mercury. As the lines lit up, they effused a hazy luster. Klein rapidly retracted his arms and saw the luster grow richer. He then enveloped the silver sheet and the worm of time's corpse inside. Suddenly, the darkness around the altar distorted as the entire space seemed to turn abnormal. This change disappeared as fast as it came. The charms filled with strange patterns slowly landed on the desk. It was entirely translucent in color and was dark black. It was like a miniature card made out of a special crystal. It also resembled the eyes of a particular existence that was watching this world. It succeeded. It really works. Klein was delighted as he hurriedly picked up the charm. He found it cold to the touch as if he was touching snow. Regardless of the resulting effects of the charm, just its formation had meant a success. Klein had once again obtained a high-level charm at the demigod level. He busied himself again, bringing the completed item above the gray fog. He then used dream divination to figure out how to use it. The charm which was in the shape of a black crystal card had only one effect, but it was highly potent. It was to siphon off the luck of others, and to be precise, it was to graft fate. A period of the target's fate would be grafted onto the user. The simplest situation would be when an enemy is about to kill me, I'll use this charm, siphoning off his fate of surviving, as well as grafting the fate of impending death onto Thim. Then, the situation would be developed into him clearly succeeding, only for him to die. It does match the Marauder Pathway's usual traits, but it's more sinister and terrifying. It's going from stealing wealth to stealing fate. If the worm of time were alive, and I was able to fully employ the power of the mysterious space above the gray fog, this charm might even point towards the domain of time. As Klein thought, he felt a sense of fear. If it wasn't for the assistance that this mysterious space had given him by obstructing and purging things, he had no way to deal with a worm of time. Phew, now it's mine. I can't call it a worm of time anymore. I'll just call it Luck Siphon. Klein once again got busy as he brought back the Luck Siphon charm to the real world. After dealing with the traces of the ritual, he gravely placed the high-level charm into the iron cigar case, putting it together with Azik's copper whistle and the center gold coin. He then sealed and isolated the case with a wall of spirituality. Being in a good mood, Klein didn't feel sleepy. He drew the curtains a little and allowed the crimson moonlight to shine in, illuminating his room with tranquility and silence. While he was enjoying the scenery, he suddenly saw a figure sneak out from Member of Parliament Macht's house as it approached amidst the shadows. It was none other than Hazel Macht. She once again headed for the sewers, removed the manhole cover, climbed down, and didn't forget to close the cover. Why is she always heading into the sewers? It's not likely for her to be heading to other areas from here to act like a superhero in the mysterious world. After all, each trip doesn't take her more than an hour. Unless she has very reliable intelligence, it's difficult to achieve anything. Besides, this will make it easy for her to be caught by the official Bayonders. Together with the scene provided to me by Arrows, she's likely finding something. Hum, it's very easy for her to encounter danger if she keeps heading into the sewers. Klein stood behind the curtain gap as he observed what was happening under the serene night. He didn't attempt to warn Hazel or let the Wraith possess her to let her understand the dangers of the Beyonder world. Firstly, this was because he had quite a subjective view that Hazel's sense of superiority was due to a result of her lacking knowledge and mysticism, so he couldn't be sure. Secondly, he wasn't sure how she had obtained Beyonder powers and a mystical item. Warning her out of gratitude for her kind deed earlier would easily attract unwanted attention or even trouble. After enjoying an evening of peace, Klein returned to bed and slept till daybreak. Before Richardson entered, he turned into Jamin Sparrow and prayed to the fool. I can accept the mission, but regardless of the outcome, I want a stone from that bracelet of yours, as well as the ability to use that spellbook of yours for some time. If it succeeds, all spoils of war will be mine. You can only take the target's head. If required, you will need to provide assistance. Chapter 772 Walter's Abnormality He wants a stone from my bracelet and the right to use Leimano's travels for some time. How does he know that I have those two items? I don't remember mentioning it during the tarot gatherings. After hearing Jame and Sparrow's response, Frizz was bewildered and rather shocked. It felt like he had seen through all her secrets. She tensed up as she quickly tried recalling how this information could have been leaked. 
aside from Teacher, Zio, and Mr. Fool. No one knows that I have these two items, especially Leimano's travels. I haven't even used it. Mr. Fool, hum. Mr. World appears quite strange during the tarot gatherings. He never hands over Emperor Roselle's diary pages, and he doesn't seem to put any effort into this, nor does he show any concern. He and Mr. Fool have a deeper connection. He obtains the relevant information from him. A believer or a blessed, for as carefully thought over the matter as she grasped something, easing her horror from before. Only at this moment did she have the time and energy to consider if she could accept Jam and Sparrow's requests. To Fors, such a price was too cheap, far lower than she had expected. Furthermore, it was reasonable. As a Bayonder who seldom went out and just stayed home writing and resting, lending Leimano's travels for some time didn't affect her safety or her need to use it. And likewise, giving one of the two remaining stones in the bracelet that allowed her to travel through the spirit world didn't cause her to lose all her trump cards. The only problem is that Mr. World seems to be willing to only try it once. If he fails, he will still take the payment. Yes, with the fact that he needs to bear the risk, that's normal. I originally imagined that I would need to help him do many things and obtain a reward from teacher by using the trader's head to repay the debt. For his thought calmly for a few seconds before she prayed to Mr. Fool. Please inform Mr. World that I accept his conditions, and I will try my best to provide him assistance in the operation. He originally wished to warn Jam and Sparrow that using the stone might result in the side effect of receiving the ravings of the full moon, but she then realized that it was apparently only something Bayonders from the Apprentice Pathway encountered. Regardless if it succeeds or fails, I'll obtain that stone. I'll be able to secretly leave Backland and meet with Mr. Hanged Man to explore that primitive island. When the time comes, I'll use the spellbook to record the usage of the stone. That way, I don't have to worry about the return trip. That's unless my luck is terrible and the recording fails. Klein secretly heaved a sigh of relief, opened the door, and got Richardson to help him dress up. Sir, after breakfast, your schedule is to head to the Royal Museum to see the Royal Family's Collection Exhibition. As Richardson helped his employer wear his coat, he informed him of the day's schedule. As Duane Dante's mastered social dancing very quickly, the number of etiquette classes in the morning went from five times a week to three times a week, allowing him to spare time for other things. And such exhibitions were definitely a hot topic of conversation in high society circles. By not going in person, it would make him appear lacking. As for heading to St. Samuel Cathedral for the bishop's preachings, Klein had consciously lowered his frequency. This wasn't because he needed to donate tens of pounds each time but that he was afraid that heading there frequently despite having the novelty period wear off would incur suspicion. Being natural and reasonable were the core traits of his plans. Other than on a Sunday, he planned on randomly heading to church on two of the remaining six days. He wanted to rely on an even longer period of time to accumulate intelligence so as to figure out a pattern. He couldn't be impatient or in a rush. I'm already looking forward to it. Klein looked at the dignified reflection of himself as he said to his valet with a smile. Upon thinking of St. Samuel Cathedral and the Church of Evernight, he naturally connected it to Leonard Mitchell's secret investigation of Sherlock Moriarty. He didn't understand what he was suspicious about. Is it because of Emlyn White's purchase of Tinder that drove Leonard to investigate the people related to him? Or was it because of the fleeting appearances of the detective in the cases of Capham and Landis that made the Red Gloves who are in charge of the investigations notice something? Or could it be both? Klein thought about the clues that he had left behind and had a rough guess. He wasn't afraid that Sherlock Moriarty would be wanted by the Church of Evernight and given a bounty. After all, apart from contacting a few people that he was familiar with, the detective wasn't to appear again. He was worried that someone would discover that Sherlock Moriarty, in his early appearances, resembled Klein Morty greatly, and as such, they would pursue the deceased former Nighthawk. In fact, it's not a problem even if they discover that. I'm no longer the clown or magician from before. There are more than a handful of demigods searching for me. Even with the high-ranking deacons of the church, there won't be any qualitative changes. Besides, Benson and Melissa truly are ordinary people. The church will definitely not involve them and disturb their lives. I wonder if they will claim the bereavement compensation back. Probably not, for there's no way they can explain it to ordinary people. Klein wasn't that worried with all the debt he was in. This was also why he was so calm when he heard Will Ossipton mention Klein Morty's identity last night. How could a sequence one angel who was good at fate-related abilities and had previously interacted with Sherlock Moriarty early on not discover the detective's origins? Even with the grey fog's obstruction that interfered with many details, Will Ossipton was definitely able to know that Sherlock Moriarty originally came from Tingen. And back in Tingen, Klein had interacted with a youth named Ademisol 
who was of the monster pathway, leading him to bleed from his eyes. And if Will Ossipton were to be aware of this and make a comparison, the answer was obvious. If Leonard were to really realize Sherlock Moriarty's hidden identity, I wonder what kind of expression he would have. Klein gave a self-deprecating laugh as he walked out the master bedroom. He went to the second floor to enjoy the breakfast his cook had prepared specially for him. Westboro, 2 Kings Avenue, Royal Museum. Klein passed through the ticket entrance with Butler Walter and Valet Richardson and went into the museum. The exhibition was held by the lone royal family. They showcased all kinds of collections that had historical meaning from the kingdom's founding so as to allow the public to enjoy and gain an understanding. It was a way to raise the kingdom's citizens' respect and recognition of the royal family. As a graduate from the Department of History, Klein was still rather interested in the exhibition. Many of the matters that he was very familiar with had the corresponding items appear here. They allowed him to plunge into the long and fascinating history from another angle. What left Klein somewhat puzzled was Walter's deep understanding towards most of the exhibits. He introduced them to Duane Dantes with extreme detail, as expected of a butler who came from an aristocratic household. Klein silently nodded. As he perused the exhibits, the trio kept encountering other visitors, and the exhibition hall was quiet and orderly, so people had to converse in whispers. When passing by an exhibit, Klein noticed Walter suddenly stop. He then glanced to his side as his expression turned complicated. As he wasn't a spectator, Klein wasn't able to interpret the actual meaning of those complicated feelings. All he could do was trace Walter's gaze towards the exhibit. Standing in front of the exhibit were a man and a woman. The man was in his thirties and wore a black suit, silk hat, and a gold inlaid cane, looking like a gentleman of status and wealth. The woman was in a yellow dress with a golden necklace. Her overall attire was inclined towards bright colors. Mr. Butler is looking at that man. Klein instantly made the judgment as he swept his gaze past the target without anyone detecting him. He realized that the man looked rather old. His skin was dark as a result of frequent exposure to the sun. The back of his hand was like dried wood and his fingers were extremely rough. If I didn't look at his attire, I would have believed it if someone told me he was a farmer, gardener, or carriage driver. Klein retracted his gaze as he felt a little puzzled. The reason why he noticed these details was because he had seriously considered the appearance of an ordinary person who had ventured in the southern continent for extended periods of time back when he was constructing the identity of Duane Dantes. He believed that apart from his gaze, bearing, and natural facial features that were etched by his rich experience. Duane Dantes also needed to have details, such as skin that had experienced long periods of sun tanning, unobvious scars, and rough but strong palms. Otherwise, it wouldn't be enough to prop up such a character's inherent traits. I have to say that from the moment I became a faceless, I'm getting more and more experienced and wise in the aspect of creating a new character. If I were to return to Earth, even without my Bayonder powers, I'll have strong acting skills. As Klein made self-deprecating comments inwardly, he saw Walter recover from his stern look as though nothing had happened. As for the man with somewhat old facial features and rough skin, he pointed at a flag inside the exhibition case. This is the flag that the Earl of Lastings, Prince Herod's Augustus used during the White Rose War. Unfortunately, he perished in that war. However, his death was the turning point of the entire war, and the reason why Lone eventually clinched victory. Look, the flag still has his blood. He's quite knowledgeable in the field of history. Klein gaze swept towards Walter from the corner of his eye, thought for two seconds, and smiled. He approached the couple and interjected in a friendly manner. I never expected such a neglected tidbit of history would be known by someone else. I originally believed that the people's understanding of the White Rose War was only limited to Lone's victory against Antis. Sir, your eruditeness leaves me amazed. To be praised in front of his female partner, the man's expression turned from a wary one to a relaxed one. A gleeful smile appeared on his face. I'm just a person who likes history. He casually swept his gaze towards the servant of the gentleman in front of him as he suddenly frowned before easing his brows. There were remnant looks of puzzlement. Indeed, he knows Butler Walter. Klein smiled while maintaining his composure. Hello there, I'm a merchant from Daisy, Duane Dantes. How may I address you? The man hesitated and said, William Sykes, a land steward at a manor. Chapter 773, Additional Development William Sykes, a land steward. Klein inwardly repeated the response he got before turning the topic of conversation towards the flag and the White Rose War. After a short chat, he politely bade farewell and walked towards the other exhibits with Walter and Richardson. He continued his own tour of the exhibits, as though his encounter from before was completely trivial, a conversation that was purely coincidental. 
When it was almost noon, Klein, who had returned to his high-end four-wheeled carriage, looked out at the passing bicycles when he suddenly said, Walter, you seem to know Mr. William Sykes. Walter solemnly nodded and said, I once knew him while I was working for Viscount Conrad's household. He served a member of the royal family, the former Earl of Lastings, Prince Edisac. He didn't conceal anything, and he described William Sykes's background in detail. He was once in service of Prince Edisac. He's living quite a good life after the prince passed away because of the great smog of Backlund. I wonder what manner he's the land steward of. Perhaps he knows some secrets. Klein gently nodded and didn't probe further. He was wondering if he should find an opportunity to investigate William Sykes. If William Sykes really knows something, the royal family's faction wouldn't leave him be. Or perhaps he is part of that faction. In short, investigating him will be a rather dangerous matter. There's no way to entrust this matter to Miss Magician, M. Lynn White, or Miss Zio. Miss Sharon has the ability to do so, but this might result in destroying her peaceful life. The best solution is still to use Hero Bandit Black Emperor. But the problem is that before stealing the Antigonus family's notebook, my investigations of the Great Smog of Backland should only be superficial. I shouldn't alarm anyone or bring about any accidental changes. Klein appeared to admire the streets outside, but many thoughts were going through his mind. Finally, he decided to hold back for the time being, being unwilling to affect the most pertinent matter he had at present. After having lunch and taking a nap, Klein received classes in literary appreciation until it was almost evening. After sending away his teacher, he was just about to head to the second story's dining hall when he suddenly heard the doorbell ring. Amidst the ringing, Klein saw Richardson immediately take a few steps forward to open the door. Standing outside were two police officers in black and white checkered uniforms. From their epaulets, one of them was a high-ranking inspector while the other was a sergeant. Officers, how may I help you? Richardson asked on behalf of his employer. The high-ranking inspector was a thin man and had his black hair hidden under his peak cap. His sideburns had a little color as he swept his gaze into the house before warmly saying with a smile, I'm here for Mr. Dwayne Dantes. There's a case that involves him and his butler. What is it? Klein slowly walked to the door. I'm Dwayne Dantes. After introducing himself, he asked politely, Officers, how may I address you? If the matter is a little more complicated and needs more time, why not come to my parlor? We can discuss it over tea. The other police officer, the sergeant, was an elegant lady. She was clearly interested in taking up the offer as she looked at the high-ranking inspector, awaiting the decision of her superior. Due to the church of the Evernight goddess, the lone police force had plenty of female officers, but due to the other faiths and the prevailing trends of society, they suffered some form of discrimination when it came to promotions and positions. They mostly did clerical work, and there was an invisible ceiling for their career development. The high-ranking inspector smiled and said, There's no need for tea, but we need to question your servants. He paused before getting to the main point. Mr. Dwayne Dantes, do you know a person by the name of William Sykes? I got to know him this morning at the Royal Museum. Klein vaguely sensed that some sort of unexpected development had occurred as he asked, Did something happen to him? The high-ranking inspector wiped away his smile and said, He's dead. He died at a hotel near the Royal Museum. He's dead. Klein didn't hide his puzzlement and shock. I just met him, and he's dead. Had he already been targeted? The inspector nodded solemnly and said, Yes, the cause of death is rather complicated, and we aren't ruling out the possibility of murder. What about his female partner? Klein frowned as he asked. He had a female partner when I met him. That lady was his mistress. When she left the hotel, William Sykes was still alive. This can be confirmed by the attendants at the hotel because they had later sent him red wine. The inspector simply shared the situation and said, After leaving the Royal Museum, where did you go? I came back here directly. I had lunch, took a nap, and attended lessons. My servants, neighbors, and literary appreciation teacher can prove that, Klein frankly replied. He then turned his head to Richardson and said, Bring Walter here. Soon, Walter walked down from the second story with a white glove and answered similar questions. After receiving Dwayne Dantes's permission, the two officers questioned the rest of his servants, but they failed to find any problems. They didn't stay for long, politely bidding him farewell and visiting the other neighbors. Klein's appetite wasn't affected by this matter as he went to the second story to enjoy his dinner. Time quickly flew by as he spent the rest of the time reading books and newspapers. Before sleeping, Klein took in the scenery outside the window as he awaited his valet, Richardson, to take away the fruits in the room. Suddenly, he asked without turning his head, what did Walter do in the afternoon? 
He was busy handling various matters. He never left, Richardson answered softly. Klein nodded gently without asking further. He began suspecting if he had been overthinking matters. Phew. He slowly exhaled before getting into bed. In the middle of the night, Klein's spirituality was triggered as he snapped awake. He pricked up his brows, left the bed, and arrived by the window. He pulled back the curtains a little. Under the dim moonlight, a figure carefully passed through the garden's trail and arrived by the perimeter walls before flipping over it. He had a broad forehead with raven black hair and stern brown eyes. He was none other than Butler Walter. He's agile and his motions are fluid. If he's not trained, he's a low-sequence beyonder. Klein observed the scene as he made a preliminary judgment. He saw Walter's shadows follow the streets until he arrived at the manhole which Hazel often used to enter the sewers. He removed the manhole cover, climbed down, and didn't forget to close the cover. Why is everyone so skilled at getting into the sewers? Mr. Butler likely hasn't done it in the past, otherwise, my spirituality would have warned me. After all, he's leaving from my territory. It means that before he became my butler, he had performed such actions quite frequently elsewhere. Klein curled his lips, returned to his bedside, and took out of the iron cigar case from under his pillow. He controlled Wraith Center to tail Walter, wanting to see what he was up to. I hope it doesn't exceed 100 meters, otherwise, I'll need to enter the sewers as well. As Klein silently muttered to himself, he returned to the gap in the curtains. His marionette, Center, immediately used the mysterious connection between different mirrors to jump to the street lamp beside the manhole before passing the manhole to silently tail Walter. Klein saw that Walter turned into a more secluded and dark passage after taking 10 meters forward. On the wall were all kinds of moss and dirt. Suddenly, the butler stopped and said to someone, Why were you so rash? Why didn't you wait for a better opportunity? Soon, a weak and slightly hoarse female's voice replied to Walter's inquiry. It was the best opportunity. Once he returns to that manor, there's no knowing when he will come out again. But why would you be so seriously injured? Walter said with sighs of concern. The female voice scoffed and said, William Sykes is stronger than what you or I imagined. Perhaps only this way can he satisfy his secret identity. Regardless, I finally obtained clues from him. After so much time, I finally have a chance to approach the truth. You didn't need to be so rash. Walter fell silent. The weak female's voice chuckled and said, I've already sold my soul to an evil god. The only meaning to life is vengeance. In a rare instance, Walter sighed and said, Continue hiding here. I'll prepare food for you until you recover. If there aren't any accidents, use the old method to contact me. The weak female voice remained silent for a while before saying, When he was alive, he had many subordinates who claimed to be loyal. After his death, few still remember him or are willing to risk their lives for him. You are the one who has surprised me the most. He is the first noble who treated me that way, and he is the person I'm truly loyal to, Walter answered in a deep voice. Having heard the conversation with his marionette, Klein vaguely understood the entire story. After Prince Edisak passed away, a few of his loyal subordinates were investigating the truth of his suicide. Walter was one of them. However, he was mainly in charge of gathering any superficial intelligence, as well as using his identity to provide some help. This is probably the additional development that Erodes mentioned. Klein immediately made Senner go invisible as he infiltrated the secluded passageway and saw Walter conversing with someone while standing. His figure blocked a black-dressed woman who was seated on the ground against the wall. Her face was somewhat pale. After the woman heard Walter's words, she gave a throaty laugh and looked towards the entrance. It's time you leave. Don't be caught by others. She turned her head, allowing Klein to see her. She had a round face, slender eyes, and a gentle and refined temperament. Deep down, she was sweet and was an outstandingly gorgeous beauty who Klein was familiar with. Trissy, Trissy Cheek. Chapter 774, Clues. She isn't dead. She managed to escape. She's actually trying to seek revenge for Prince Edisak. At that moment that he saw Trissy, Klein nearly lost control of his expression. Although he had guessed it based on the conversation, he still felt it exceeded his expectations when the truth was placed before him. Without even the need for a dream divination, he could still recall the great smog of Backlund. Trissy had conversed with him, and back then, she was eager to escape Prince Edisak's control and escape the manipulation of her fate by the hidden person behind the scenes. She felt her daily life was filled with pain. This demoness who was once a man had sold her soul to an evil god to help avenge Prince Edisak. What kind of crappy trite romance plot point is this? The corners of Klein's lips twitched as he saw Walter throw a bag of food to Trissy. After hearing him give a few words of advice, he turned and left the secluded path. At this moment, a figure appeared from Member of Parliament Mack's house. It was within Klein's line of sight from where he was standing. 
It followed the shadows in the street as it quickly approached the entrance to the sewer. She was none other than Hazel who held a mystical item from the Marauder Pathway. She'll encounter Walter. This isn't some entrance to the sewers. It's clearly the entrance to a bustling city. Klein looked down and nearly facepalmed. Upon arriving at the manhole, Hazel warily observed her surroundings for a few seconds before moving the cover away and climbing down. The entire process was done in one fell swoop without any signs of delay. Stepping onto the slightly moist ground, she followed the rusted metal pipes and the sewage that slowly flowed with a clear destination in mind. Suddenly, she felt her back turn cold as a chill ran down her spine. Her hair began to stand on end. Right on the heels of that, Hazel seemed to plunge into a freezing river and she felt a coldness that was overcoming her body. She was horrified to see herself walking in a different direction heading straight for the wall with metal pipes. And this was completely against her will. Horror filled Hazel's mind before she received a reprieve from her numb thoughts. She infused all her spirituality into the necklace on her neck. The seven green gems on the necklace were equidistant from each other. Embedded around them were tiny diamonds. In the absolute darkness, they still swirled with a faint lustrous glow. Suddenly, a gem lit up as the green glow illuminated Hazel's ghastly face. She leaned against the wall and paused for a moment. She moved her feet forward in an awkward manner before retracting them. At that instant, the coldness Hazel felt had paused for a moment. She didn't hesitate to use her spirituality to light up another green gem. She raised her right hand, aimed it at herself, and twisted her wrist. At the same time, many mysterious symbols and patterns appeared in her mind as her spirituality and voice changed momentarily. She had stolen the Bayonder power, Wraith Shriek. Hazel was just about to open her mouth to shout when she found her hands losing control again. She forcefully and quickly covered her mouth with her hands. Her shriek turned into a muffle as she took a few brisk steps to the wall. She turned into another fork before crouching down in the pure darkness. She tried hard to struggle, but it was useless. She wasn't even capable of activating the necklace on her neck. Hazel's dark brown eyes widened as they filled with horror and indignation. Tears began to well in her eyes before slowly streaming down her cheeks. And at this moment, Walter had come out from another path, returning back to the sewer entrance before climbing up agilely. After he sneaked back into 160 Bockland Street, Hazel suddenly regained control of her body. She felt that the coldness had completely disappeared. She first raised her hands in surprise, using her night vision to take a glance. Following that, she looked around in a fluster, as though there were countless unknown monsters hidden in the darkness of the sewers. Hazel immediately touched the necklace with her right hand, carefully stood up, and headed for the entrance. She didn't flee in panic, but she instead warily prepared for any attack that would appear from the darkness. Finally, she returned to Bockland Street where she saw the black street lamp emitting its light, illuminating the streets that still had the remnant signs of rain. Only then did Hazel speed up her pace and run home. Midway, she suddenly turned back, nervously and frantically closing the manhole's cover. After doing all of this, she followed the shadows and entered her garden. With the help of the gas and water pipes, she entered the balcony to her bedroom. Only at that point did she really have any room to think. She widened her eyes and subconsciously looked around. Slowly, her body began to tremble. She raised her left arm, hoping to use her clothes to wipe her face, but she paused midway, switching to using a handkerchief from her pocket. <clears throat> Hazel still has the basic abilities needed to react. She is not a complete newbie. In the sewers, Senner appeared with his dark red coat and triangular hat as he spoke silently. Following that, under Klein's control, he went invisible again as he entered the hidden fork where Trissy was. Just as the wraith approached, the black-dressed Trissy looked up and revealed a weak but stubborn smile. From the looks of it, you have no ill intentions. That lady was quite lucky. She had sensed Hazel and discovered the wraith. Senner's figure appeared as he chuckled. Perhaps killing her will only bring you greater trouble. To be honest, he wished to report Trissy to the authorities because he knew of the evil deeds she had done. He knew how she had incited the passengers and crew on the Alfalfa, causing them to kill each other out at sea. He also knew how she had many innocent lives die ahead of time. However, after realizing that Trissy was investigating the mystery behind Prince Edisac's death, Klein had a new plan in mind. He would incite the demoness and cooperate with her on certain matters. The mystery of Prince Edisac's death was equivalent to the truth of the Great Smog of Backland. Investigating this matter is bound to be very dangerous. Roping others in will make me feel guilty, afraid that harm or even death will happen to them as a result. By getting Trissy to do it, I wouldn't have such a psychological burden. The crimes she had committed had long doomed her to hell. 
The only problem is that she might be using the investigations of the mystery to Prince Edisac's death for her own ploys. I have to be wary about this to prevent myself from being used, thus causing a disaster. As Klein thought, he made Senner take two steps forward. Trissy looked at the middle-aged before her and chuckled. Since you have ill intentions, go ahead, Mr. Senner. At this instant, the marionette's senses revealed countless threads floating and flailing around Trissy, and seated in the middle was her black dress self with a pale face. It resembled a spider in the middle of her web, but it was filled with temptation and pity that made one approach her. You know me. The marionette halted in his footsteps. Trissy's expression was somewhat adrift as she answered in reverie. I once spent an unforgettable period of time at sea. Back then, you were still a man. Klein lampooned and chuckled. Why are you investigating Prince Edisac's death? Didn't he commit suicide? Trissy immediately looked up as anger colored her face. Suicides can be different. Some people do it willingly, others are forced. No way, she really seems to mind Prince Edisac's death. Lady, have you forgotten that you were once a man? Have you forgotten the pain you were previously talking about? Don't tell me that this is the so-called Stockholm Syndrome where you end up bonding with your captor due to the minute amount of kindness they've provided. Well, I'm not a spectator, and I can't determine if she's being truthful or not. Klein made Senner chuckle. So, you believe that Prince Edisac was forced to commit suicide? You sought William Sykes to investigate this matter. The angry look on Trissy's face vanished as a miserable but beautiful smile appeared. That's right. It was he who forced Edisac to commit suicide with a spirituality obliteration bullet. However, he was also under orders by others. Ha! To obtain the final bit of pleasure, he revealed everything. Ha ha! He was still unable to really touch me. I even showed him my former photo. He died filled with even more misery and despair. I can't imagine what William suffered. Trissy is as twisted as she was before. Demonesses at the stage of pleasure are really filled with charms. Every expression and every action are filled with enticement. But I can tell that Trissy has already reined it in very well, only using it when needed. She has already advanced. Or is it because of love? As Klein lampooned, he made Senner ask, who is it? When asking that question, Klein hadn't expected to receive an answer, but Trissy chuckled and replied, Viscount Stratford, the royal guard captain of the royal family.